Now we turn again to the Gospel according to Matthew and in chapter 13. Another of the parables that the Lord Jesus teaches in this chapter, giving instruction concerning the kingdom of heaven. Every parable shows a different aspect of the kingdom of heaven. And we come to verse 33 this evening, a very brief parable. Another parable spake he unto them, The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal, till the whole was leavened. Leaven, of course, is, is, the, um, is yeast, and the idea is that you place the, the leaven into a batch of dough, as you place yeast into a batch of dough, and the leaven or the yeast goes on to affect the whole lump of dough. And that's the picture, very simply. Now, leaven, of course, is often associated in the scriptures with sin or evil. And in that connection, it speaks about a corrupting influence wherever it's found. Paul speaks in 1 Corinthians 5 to the effect that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, the yeast in a lump of dough. And some have thought that that's what's meant here, that the kingdom of heaven, or the church if you like, here upon earth, is susceptible to corruption. When sin or evil or wrong doctrine gets into a church, then it spreads across the church and it causes problems and it causes, in the end, apostasy. Well, that's all true, but that's not what this parable is about. This is a very different kind of leaven. If the mustard seed parable, you remember back to last week, is about the external growth of the kingdom, it begins as a small seed, and then by the grace of God, the, the kingdom grows and it ends up being, in the parable, like a, a tree, that is sufficient for birds of the air to come and, and nest in, to settle in, where well, the kingdom of heaven begins just as a small seed, and, but spreads across the world, and it grows, and it grows, and it grows, and it becomes something that is vast, and something that is most wonderful. Well, that's, if you like, the external growth of the kingdom. The parable of the leaven is the internal, or the spiritual growth, of the kingdom, or if you like, it's how the kingdom actually does grow. Leaven is the growth of the kingdom, first within a believer, and then spreading out to affect the society around that believer and that church. That's how it seems to be. So think of it in this way to begin with, that the kingdom of heaven comes to a person, the grace of God comes to a person. Here's a worldly person, an unbelieving person, and the Lord by his grace begins to do a work within that person, convicting that person of their sin, bringing them to repentance, and bringing them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now that affects and changes the positional position, or the, the position of the person in terms of a relationship to God. Before, he is an enemy of God, he is outside of the kingdom, but the person is changed and converted and his position before God is altered. Now, he's justified by faith, he's reconciled unto God, he's now under the spiritual rule of Christ and in his care. So, his position before God has been altered. But at conversion, what we know from the Word of God is that the Spirit of God takes up residence within the person. This is a great mystery, but this is what we're taught in the Scriptures. And if conversion is a positional change, the taking up of residence by the Spirit of God brings about a personal change. And the whole person is affected by the Holy Spirit what Paul calls elsewhere, the making of a new creature. The old is passed away and the new has come. And so the idea seems to be that 
when a person is converted, the Spirit of God comes like yeast or like leaven and begins to work so that the whole of the person is altered. And I want us to think about that in three particular ways tonight. First of all, the mind is changed, the thought life, and then the affections are changed, and the will is changed, and therefore the whole life is changed. You see, it begins like leaven, and then the whole of the person becomes altered and transformed. We begin with the mind. And we begin with the mind because that's where the God, Word of God and the Gospel of God first comes to us. It comes to the mind. God never bypasses the mind. God comes to us and speaks to us through the mind. We've got the Word of God written in the way that it's written. And it's a word that we understand in the first place with our minds. We have a mental or an intellectual understanding of it. But before that happens, what are we like? Where are we? In the world, we've got no thought of God. We've got no understanding of God's ways, no concept of his claims. We've got no interest in his word. And if we were to read it, we wouldn't understand what it was talking about. Well, there are many mysteries in the word of God. The Song of Solomon, from which we read earlier in the, in the service, has is, is, is been a great mystery to many, and it's been grossly and terribly misinterpreted by, by some. And I wouldn't dare to speak from the pulpit over some of the things I've, I've seen, seen advertised. But uh, what my point is that not all of the word is easily understood, but the word of God is to be understood. The gospel of Christ, as often we say, is simple enough for a child to grasp, but profound enough to, to, to startle the most learned of theologians. But it comes to us through the mind. But before it comes to us in our minds, there's no understanding of it. There's no thought of God and of all of these spiritual truths. We have a secular mindset. We think in terms of how the world thinks the world in which we live. We're affected by it. We live for the present life. We live for its pleasures. We live for its prosperity. We live for worldly success. And that's the kind of thing that the world presents to us and we readily accept it because of our sinful thought life. But when we're converted, the mind is altered. The thought life is affected. The leaven gets in and begins to change the mind and the way that we think and so on. We've got a new set of information to hand that we never had before. We've got the Bible. We've got the means of understanding it that we never had before. The Holy Spirit and the teaching that comes through the church. <clears throat> and we begin to understand its meaning. We feel its power as it operates upon us. And we're changed by all of these things. Our minds are affected. The way that we think is altered. The whole approach and outlook on life that we have begins to be changed. We think differently from how we used to think. We don't think anymore that life is about things and possessions and pleasing the senses. That's not how we think anymore. Life is about God. And God becomes central to everything. He's the, the controlling influence. And our mind world is altogether different. This leaven that is now in us and that has come and affected the mind makes us have new aspirations and desires. We want to learn about him. We understand something of his word, but we want to understand more of his word. We want to live in his way and for his glory. We want to form and make our choices and decisions based upon what we now know, what the Word of God has taught us. You see, our mind and our thought life has been altogether altered. We're now able to look at life and to face life with what we understand about God's will and God's ways and what his promises are. We don't think in the way that we used to. We don't immediately fall into a panic when something seems to go wrong. 
we think differently. We think of the truth that God is above all things and controlling all things. And when we face our difficulties and our challenges and our trials, we think to ourselves, well, I know where to go with this. I know what to do with this. I know I can come to God. I know I can come to my Father. I know I can find comfort from the Scriptures. Thinking is a whole different process and it goes along completely different lines. And as we go through life, we have this thought running through our minds constantly that we're accountable to God. We have to stand to give an account to Him one day. And that thought will not leave us. And it will affect, won't it, the things that we do and the way that we live. So it begins in the mind. The leaven alters the thought life. But it doesn't stop there. It's not just an intellectual thing. It's conversion and the Christian life as well, we know. Because the leaven, the work of God's Spirit, goes on to change the affections. Now, what do we mean by affections? Learned men have written great tomes about this, but let me put it very simply. The affections within us really concern what or who we hold dear to our hearts. Who do we love? Who draws our hearts? In the first chapter of the Song of Solomon, the, 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 the Bride of Christ, the Church of Christ says, Draw me, we will run after thee. And this is the affections, wanting to run after the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's not like that before the leaven takes um, place in our hearts. Until we're converted, we have a love and an affection for ourselves. Not denying, of course, that we have a love and affection for those who are near and dear to us. We don't deny that, of course. That's a common thing. But primarily, when you boil things down, we will find a very real affection for ourselves. We want to please ourselves. Ourselves are the most important person in many respects. Our affections lie toward the world and its pleasures. If you go to people out there in the world tonight and you ask them where they want to be and what they want to be doing and what kind of company they want to keep, well, they'll tell you and it will be very revealing. It will be exactly what we would expect them to say, but you won't find them saying, well, my, my affections are drawn to God and to Christ and to his word and to his church and his people. They won't say that. My affections are drawn to the football match or the shops or my ambitions and my holidays and all the rest of it. That's what people talk about and they, they talk about it because that's where their affections lie. And of course the worst of it all is that our affections are towards our sin. Why do people sin? Because they like it. They enjoy it. In Hebrews, it spoke about Moses who denied the pleasures of sin for a season. You notice that? The pleasures of sin. People don't do what they don't like doing and they enjoy sinning and so they sin. And so before conversion, our affections are altogether in a different direction. And the Lord and everything to do with him, anything to do with him, has little, if any place at all, in the heart's of the people are but once saved, the leaven that starts in the mind goes on to change the affections. And we find ourselves with a love for the Lord. We think in the first place of the price he paid for redemption, all that he endured for love of us. And we have no conception really of what it meant to him, the Holy One, to bear away our sins. We can't enter into it. We have the scriptural record of it. We have it described unto us. But you can't enter into what it meant to the Holy One to bear away our sins. But he paid that price. And how can we not love one who went to such degrees of suffering for our sakes that we might be saved? And then we love the Lord, of course, for the blessings that those sufferings purchased. To be justified, 
to be declared right, even though we're not. God declares us right for the sake of Christ. To be adopted into his family, to be called the children, the sons of God. To be glorified. That's already true in principle. One day it will be true in experience. But God, by his grace, has set this whole chain of blessings in place. Elect, called, justified, adopted, and one day to be glorified. And that's what the sufferings of Christ have purchased for us. And we love the Lord because of the blessings that we have. We wouldn't have them other than if it were not for him. Oh, but we love the Lord for some much higher cause. We love the Lord for himself. Won over by his love, so rich, so unmerited, so deep, so constant. That's why when you begin to understand the meaning of the book of the Song of Solomon, you begin to grasp First of all, the love of Christ for his church. And then you begin to see what the love of a converted, saved person ought to be for their saviour. We love him because he first loved us. And that love for us is so deep and so sure and so profound that you read Words in the Song of Solomon, just as an example, verse 2 of chapter 1. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for thy love is better than wine. That's love for the person of the Son of God, our Saviour. And the chapter that we read from, chapter 5 and verse 16. His mouth is most sweet, yea, he is altogether lovely. So it's not loving him just for what he did, not loving him just for what he purchased for us, but we love him for what he is and who he is. Paul speaks in Ephesians 3 about the love of Christ that passeth knowledge. It's his prayer for the Ephesian church that they might know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. I want you to know that which is unknowable. I want to experience something of that which is beyond measure. Its height, its breadth, its length, its depth. You can't measure it. You can't fully comprehend it. But his prayer for the Ephesian believers is that they may experience some of it. He writes about this in Romans 5. The love of God that is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost that is given unto us. He speaks about it in Romans 8. As that love of Christ from which we cannot be separated by tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword. The love of Christ for us that is fixed and unquenchable unstoppable, infinite. That love that had no beginning, that love that knows no ending. And when we begin to know something of that ourselves, this leaven begins to work and we begin to love him. Our affections are not to this world anymore. Our affections are to him. For what he's paid, what he's purchased and for what he is and it's so often been said and I've often said it myself but you know what makes heaven heaven the experience of pleasures in a kind of utopian version of the world that's down here no, no what makes heaven heaven is the presence of the lover of our souls someone said that if heaven did not have Christ within it, then it would really be like hell. And I guess that's pretty close to the truth. Heaven is Christ. <laughs>
So the leaven produces this, and it goes on from there. You see it spreading and affecting the affections for all things. Love for his word, this inspired and true and trustworthy word that is a mine of treasures, and the greatest treasure of all to be found within the word is that Christ himself who's found everywhere. You find him in the book of Genesis right at the beginning, and you find him right there at the end in the book of Revelation, and he's there everywhere. He took those disciples aside, didn't he, on the road to Emmaus. And in the law and in the prophets, he showed them that all the way through, the word spoke of him. And it does. My counsel to us all is that when you read the scriptures, wherever you read them, look for Christ. Because he's there. He's to be found. And the leaven will make us love the word because in the word we find new views of God and new revelations of the Lord Jesus Christ. The affections are changed in who we love in terms of people around us. Now I'm not saying that we don't love our families and we don't love our friends and we don't love people in the world in that sense, but who do we love the most? Who do we love in a way that is most peculiar? and that is inexplicable and not understandable by the world outside, we love the church, we love the people of God. And we inevitably love the people of God because they're just like we are. Sinners saved, same spiritual experience, same hope of heaven, and you can talk to a believer, can't you, in a way that you can't talk to anybody else. And the affections are being altered, you see and love for the Lord's day. Oh, I wish that people would be able to obey that exhortation that's given in Isaiah 58, 13. Call the Sabbath a delight, a delight, a joy. Why? Because it's the Lord's day, because we lay everything to one side, we can come and worship in the church, and when we come to worship in the church, who do we find? The Saviour, who promised to be amongst his people, when even two or three are there together. The affections, you see, and the, the thread that runs through it all, the, that organises all of this, I hope you've seen it by now, is Christ himself. Christ the beginning, Christ the end, Christ that's all in between, the Alpha and the Omega, is all in the Lord Jesus and our hearts are drawn out to him and everything that is concerning him. So there's the mind, the leaven works through the mind and the wet leaven spreads into the, the affections and then the leaven spreads into the will. Oh, this is the hard bit. <laughs> but it's a wonderful leaven and it's got great power. It works its way into the will and therefore, it affects the whole of life. What do we mean by the will? Well, it's what we resolve to do. The kind of life that we resolve to live. And because the, the leaven is so effective upon the will, the life that we actually go on to live is affected. Now, so much depends upon the will. Remember what Paul wrote to the Philippians, it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do. Well, there's no doing without the will, but the will is not being truly affected unless it goes on to affect what we actually do in life. So that the final outworking of the leaven is to change the will and therefore to affect the whole of life. Now, before conversion, let's start there as we've done in the other two aspects of our makeup. Before conversion, the scriptures tell us that the will is in bondage. It's that very famous book that Martin Luther wrote, The Bondage of the Will. And it's been put into a more modern form by, by others, but, but that's what he wrote, The Bondage of the Will. And he got that from the scriptures. Paul in Romans 6 and verse 17 speaks about people prior to their conversion as being the servants of sin. 
In other words, led and dominated by sin. Sin is the master of an unconverted person. And the unconverted person is the slave of sin. And willingly so. The unconverted person doesn't want to be emancipated from the dominant master that is sin. He wants to stay there. He enjoys it, that kind of life. And Jesus spoke about the same problem in John, thir- in John 3. This is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Their will was altogether bound up in sinfulness. And he goes on to say in chapter 5 of John, verse 40, concerning the Jews of the day, or most of them, ye will not come to me that ye might have life. Now the word will that doesn't just mean, it's not just a prediction, you're not going to come to me, are you? He's saying there that you don't have the will to come to me. You don't want to come to me. You don't have the resolve to come to me that you might have life. Partly because they thought they had life already, but partly because they just rejected him altogether. And so that's the problem with the, with the unconverted human nature until the, the leaven that become, begins to work. We choose and resolve to reject the things of God and God himself. That's human choice, if you like, because of the bondage of the will, enslaved to sin. But once brought to faith in Christ, the leaven that begins in the mind and then affects the affections, it goes on to to change the will. Jesus said in John 8, verse 36, If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Not slaves to sin anymore, the will is changed. Paul says, going back to Romans 6 and verse 17, Ye were the servants of sin. You see, it's not like that anymore. You were the slaves of sin. But then he goes on to say in the next verse, verse 18 of Romans 6, Being then made free from sin, he became the servants of righteousness. Willingly so. We choose that way. We want that way. We resolve that way. And therefore the will to live as unto God is there in the heart of the believer. And the will is there to translate, if you like, the word of God into actual practice across the whole of life. What Paul talks, what describes as being the new creature. Once a servant of sin, but free from that by the grace of God, and now the will is all bent toward pleasing the Lord. And we find ourselves wanting to fight sin, and we do fight it. We want to be obedient, and we seek to be obedient. We want to serve the Lord, and we try to serve the Lord. We want to take a stand in the world and bear a testimony to the Gospel. And that's what we resolve, and that's what we actually begin to do. We want to be faithful unto the end, and we seek to do that by the grace of God. The will is altogether different, and the life, therefore, becomes altogether different. So this is the the leaven process. It's the effect that spreads throughout the whole personality of the believer. There's one more aspect before I finish. And it's this. That the leavened person then becomes like a piece of leaven in the lump of the world in which he lives. The leavened person takes the gospel into the lump that is the world outside. Not only by what we say, but by the lives that we live. By the very fact that we are what we are as converted people. We become like a a, a little piece of leaven in the world at large that knows nothing of the grace of God. That means that a Christian living, say, in a non-Christian home is like a piece of leaven and there will be an effect by, the, by the, the life that's lived, by the things that are said, by a holy influence in that home. A Christian that works in a workplace 
surrounded by unconverted people, like a little piece of leaven, ready to start its work by the grace of God. The gospel witness, the life that's lived, the honesty that's shown, all these Christian virtues, spiritual virtues that we know about. It makes an effect upon that place, the neighbourhoods in which we live. Wherever providence may take us, God puts pieces of leaven in the various lumps that are across the world and the leaven begins to do its work by the grace of God and the effect is felt across the world. We'd love to see more of that, wouldn't we? We'd love to see families converted. We'd love to see neighbourhoods transformed. We'd love to see workplaces that begin the day with prayer. Huh, that would be a thing, wouldn't it? I don't know whether it still happens in Parliament. It used to. I'm not so sure it does happen anymore. And if it does, it would be done in a very kind of perfunctory manner. Let's get that over with and let's get on with the business of the day. But what a difference it would make. What a difference it makes for Christian influence when you stand up against one thing and another and stand for the truth. Well, the Lord makes his leaven work within us and he turns us into a piece of leaven. And then we go out and spread that influence of God's grace and God's gospel across the world. It's his power. I guess that leaven can lose its power. I don't know, I didn't think to look that up before I came into the pulpit tonight. But I guess if it's left, it can lose its power. You buy most things in the supermarket today, going back to the shopping illustration that I had this morning. But almost everything has a time life upon it, doesn't it? Use, buy, because beyond that day it either doesn't taste right or it doesn't do the job that you bought it for. I even came across a packet of rock salt once and it said on the packet of rock salt, this is a complete diversion, a digression, but it said on the packet of the rock salt, formed over 140 million years in the mountains of whatever, used by August 2020. <laughs> well, you see the point, but, but, but getting back to the main point, does it lose its power? Does God lose his power? When God is at work leavening our lives and leavening our thoughts and our hearts, we won't lose that power. It's God's power. And God through us can have this leavening effect across our families, our workplaces, our neighbourhoods, and even across the country. Who knows what God's leaven is capable of doing? Well, may the Lord bless these things. Amen.